Welcome to Lit Poetry, the podcast where we go on a journey of discovery, reading, analyzing, and discussing great poetry from around the world. Poetry is worth it because the reading and writing of poetry is a revolutionary act that has the potential to transform both the reader and our world. Welcome to the Lit Poetry Podcast Season 2. In today's episode, we're venturing off to breathe in the rich and intoxicating sights and sounds of India. In the poem, Man Washing on a Railway Platform Outside Delhi, by Judith Beveridge. But don't be mistaken here. This is not some voyeuristic, superficial tourist trip into the heart of some romanticised, exotic culture. No, this poem is a rather sensitive and heartfelt meditation into the inherent dignity of our shared human reality. It is a poem that is self-aware, aware aware that the focus of its content comes to us through the eyes of a white Westerner, looking into another world and trying to breach the walls of culture and class that divide her from this other reality. This poem is, at times, a pastiche of conflicted feelings, from wonder and grace to anger and perhaps even bewilderment. Although this, of course, is my own limited reading of this poem, coloured as it is by my own upbringing, race, gender and experience. So maybe to remedy this problem, I should just let you listen to the poem for yourselves and make up your own mind. But regardless of your point of view or mine, thankfully we have Judith Beveridge on the podcast today to shine a little light on her work. I'm sure our discussion will make for interesting listening. So without further ado, may I present you with Man Washing on a Railway Platform Outside Delhi by Judith Beveridge, read to you by the wonderful Lucy Freeman. Man Washing on a Railway Platform Outside Delhi by Judith Beveridge. It's the way he stands, nearly naked in the winter sun, turning on and off the railway station tap. I've seen people look less reverent tuning Mozart. I've seen hands give coins to beggars appear nonchalant compared to the way his hands give this water to his body. Don't tell me this is a man released for a moment out of poverty, a man who wants the penance of each cold drop, a man who wants the smell of his neighbors to vanish from his skin, who wants to taste what is beyond the scum and effluent of the village ditch. And don't tell me each drop he takes to glisten his body will never be neutral, though he holds each clear spill with equality. It isn't just the water. It's the way his hands take the water from the tap to his body. It's the way he attends each pour. It's the way he decants the water back and forth as if receiving instruction for the repetition of the names of God. And it's the way he knows his poverty without privacy and the way, though the water is free, He takes careful leaders. So welcome back to the Lit Poetry Podcast. Judith Beveridge lives in Sydney, Australia. She has published seven volumes of poetry, all of which have won or been shortlisted for major prizes. Her latest volume, Sun Music, New and Selected Poems, was published by Giramondo in 2018 and won the Australian Prime Minister's Poetry Prize in 2019. She has edited and co-edited a number of anthologies, including Contemporary Australian Poetry by Puncher and Watman in 2016. She was poetry editor for the literary magazine Menjin from 2005 to 2016. Her work has been studied in schools and universities and translated into many languages. 
She taught poetry writing at postgraduate level for many years at the University of Sydney and continues to work in the community. She is a recipient of the Philip Hodgson's Memorial Medal and the Christopher Brennan Award for Excellence in Literature. So welcome, Judith, to the podcast. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you very much, James. A pleasure to be here. Oh, it's, no, it's marvellous. Um, it's absolutely my honour to have you on on board, having um, sampled your poetry over the years and read it in collections and many things like that. It's, it's wonderful to have you here. Yeah, so Judith, it would be really interesting just to start um, just by giving our listeners a bit of a background into who you are as a poet, how you got into poetry and just how it's sort of uh, informed your, your life. Sure. Um, well, I actually started to write poetry when I was about eight years old. Um, for some reason, I always just innately felt that books and reading and literature was important. Um, it may be because my parents read to me a lot as a kid, um, so I was familiar with books and 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 that sort of thing. They weren't strange to me, they were sort of friends. I was also very, very shy as a child. Um, I was one of those children that just um, found it difficult to communicate verbally with people. So I often spent a lot of time on my own and really just enjoyed my own company and being in my own imaginative space. Um, So as a result of the shyness, I think I, um, you know, if ever I wanted to communicate anything, I wrote it down. And in that regard, I found that, you know, words had a power when I put them on the page that I couldn't necessarily find or articulate uh, through speech or through speaking or communicating to people. Um, So I guess temperamentally I was probably suited to a more artistic life. Um, I was also very studious as a child. I, I wanted to I wanted to excel at something. Um, you know, I wanted to uh, have, a, have a life that, that I became not, not expert at something, but just something that I could do. Um, and so it kind of poetry fell into my lap in a way when I started to study it and read it more seriously in my late teens. Uh, I just fell in love with the art form. The more I read of it, the more I, I felt passionate about it and, and felt as though uh, this is something that I would really like to participate in. Um, I don't think I've ever been a, a natural writer. I had to get, put myself through a very long apprenticeship of, of learning how to write. Um, but it's, it's, um, you know, it's given my life an enormous richness and I can't imagine ever living without poetry. It's just been, um, it, what, it's what gets me up in the morning, basically. Yeah, that's wonderful. So there's a trajectory of your poetry, so an evolution, I suppose, over the years. What were you like as a young poet as as compared to later stages of your career? Oh, I just didn't have a clue what I was doing when I started to write James. Um, as I said, it was a just a long learning process. Um, I've always been attracted to visual things. I, I just love the look of things. You know, there's so much beauty in the visual world. So I've always had, I think, a descriptive element in my work. I like to describe um, or engage with what I see. Mm. Um, so the images have always been a very important tool, and something that I've relied on you know, quite extensively, particularly in the earlier work. Uh, as I've progressed over the years, I think I've learned to concentrate or value uh, sonic properties of of English and concentrate a lot on the musicality of what I'm doing Mm. Um, and I also find that uh, it's a way of generating content also because I'm very impressed with what Wallace Stevens said when he said uh, when you're writing a poem um, it's a good idea to you know get the intellect of the poem almost successfully and he said one of the best ways of doing this is through concentrating on the the sounds of the poem Mm. Uh, so I began to do that and it's now become quite a regular practice. So it gets my intellect and my critical mind off what I'm doing so that I'm not actually worried about what I'm saying or what I'm writing about. And I never really have been one of those poets who works from ideas. I work from very small things. Maybe it's just a word or, you know, a rhythm or a little run of image yeah, that's very interesting because um, poets do definitely have those different um, styles, if you will. 
Um, and some I can really identify as being people who focus in on ideas and the, the idea yes. is the king and it, it seems to seep through into the poetry. And others, you know, um, I spoke to Mark uh, Tredenik recently and he's, I think, quite musical in his, his poetry. Yes. And, and it's interesting because I do get a very strong visual um, image in my head in this particular poem and your poetry in general. And I can also hear the musicality. Um, and it's interesting to hear, in particular, that evolution from from the visual uh, into the into the, the sonic, I suppose. In particular, because we'd have a lot of budding um, writers out there, poets, who perhaps you know, it, sometimes the the process of writing poetry can get quite frustrating. And I think it's really useful to think about uh, you know being a poet as an, an evolution. It's a journey, and you develop skills over time. It's not just there's a, I think there's a misconception generally in society that you know poets are born not made and sure there's there's a degree at which you have to have something in you that is yearning for that expression which you've already described but a lot of it is actually um you pick up along the way don't you and you're inspired by other people you know in some ways you could probably say that a lot of poets are even thieves i know that with my (laughs) own work that you you're constantly borrowing uh techniques from elsewhere Absolutely. I mean, I think, I think you know, just, uh, you know, through reading poetry, uh, and I think reading poetry is one of the best ways to learn how to write it, because you do pick up, um, you know, hints and uh, you look at a poem and, and you say to yourself, now how's the poet done that? Um, so I think reading is extremely important in writing. Um, and it is an ongoing process. I mean, um, if it was easy, I don't think I'd want to do it. If there was no challenge in writing a poem, I can't see what the attraction would be. Um, And I think also, I don't like poems uh, that are just content driven. I like to feel that the poet has, you know, applied some sort of imaginative pressure on the language and found ways of of saying what they're saying that that are memorable and interesting. Um, so technique to me is very important. The craft of of putting a poem together is, you know, gives me great pleasure. Just you know, working at the micro level, if you like, at the micro level of sound or, you know, rhythm. You know, all those very small aspects of a poem that can make or break it. Yeah, and I think that is very um, a, a dignified approach in terms of your reader as 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 well because I think if you cram a poem too full of you know you're trying to force it into this sort of notion of an idea that you want to project to the world there's problems with that approach because but if you go on the sort of journey that you're talking about then the the poet the poem appears and the person reading the poem is then open to interpreting it in their own way and they find they'll find surprising ideas and moments in in it that will speak to them that perhaps you didn't even intend um, in in the poem which is important in your own teaching, because you've, you've taught poetry um, quite a lot and you would have read poetry with uh, groups, I imagine, can you speak a little bit about that process of, um, you know, when you're opening up a poem for discussion with groups, are you surprised sometimes with the, the ideas that come from different directions and, and is, is that a, a thing that's breathed life into the reading of poetry for you? Oh, absolutely, yes. I think so, James. Um And I think that one of the reasons that perhaps people are are a little afraid of poetry is that a poem often is ambiguous. There often are, you know, many ways of interpreting a poem. Um, And people, I think, often distrust their own responses. They think, you know, there's perhaps just a black and white answer about, about the poem. But, you know, and that's one reason I really love poetry, because of that ambiguous nature of it that it can't always be pinned down there there's not necessarily a certainty and i mean life's like that you know well i'm just thinking what a wonderful that thing that is for our modern day society because we live in this polarized world where Mm. you know there are these black and white categories and people are constantly being forced into these tunnels of thought but poetry refuses to do that and and it's interesting because if you are inclined some sort of political bent and most of us are often you'll read uh, poems and they will challenge all sorts of notions that you you have preconceived ideas and uh, your own biases i think that's the gift that it gives it does give that nuance it gives that um ambiguity which you talked about Uh, and i think when people are sitting on the fence about you know what poetry can give and why it's why it's exciting 
I think that's one of the ideas you should sell to people. Say, well, you're more alive when you're struggling and wrestling with ideas. That's when you mm-hmm. become fully human in some ways, when, when that struggle's going on. And poetry Absolutely. gives you that sort of platform to, to do that. Yeah. Absolutely, I agree with that entirely. And, and, and because poetry is, is such a broad church, you know, there are so many different approaches to writing a poem. Mm. And I think if you can expose yourself to as many as these as possible, then you're just constantly enriching your own responses, your your experience, how to how to respond to the world, um, mm. uh, uh, opening up this kind of spaciousness, I suppose, within oneself. Uh, I think it's very important. I think poetry does that for us. Yeah, I think so. Welcome back to the Lit Poetry Podcast. So, Judith, it's probably a good time to talk about the poem itself uh, that we featured here on on the program because it kind of connects us to the idea of poems working well in that ambiguous space that you were talking about. Um, I think the poem, in some ways, is hard to fully classify. Um, that's you know, man washing on a railway platform out outside Delhi. I think it can sort of uh, connect to expectations we have of a poem, but it kind of subverts that. So the poem raises important questions, I think, about, one, the inherent dignity of human beings, regardless of their station in life, but but it thankfully avoids the stereotypical sort of tropes of romanticising the lives of those in poverty and that sort of patronising colonial point of view that can come through sometimes. I hope I had done that. Thank you for that, for saying that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it, it and it raises these really important questions. It's res- wrestling with that dimension, I think. And I have this acute awareness of, of the actual narrator of the poem coming through with this voice that is sort of haunting and complex, and and in some ways confused. But there's a, there's a there's a quite an array of emotions that I think it charts across. So I suppose can you t- talk to us a little bit about writing that poem? And were they some of the sort of sentiments that sort of were coming to you when you were? forming the words for the poem and yes um and i wrote this sometime uh you know when i was back in australia after i'd spent some time in in india um and i did find india a very very challenging and complex uh, place it you know it confronts you at every level um and you do become a, very aware of your own your own privilege and your own you know station in life um but there's also something uh, I found India had that I've never found here or anywhere else and it is that sense of the people seem to feel connected with something a bit larger than themselves and I think that's what struck me about when I was watching the man using the railway station tap to to wash himself. It wasn't just a kind of opportunistic moment to find some water and use it to clean himself. Uh, It was the way that his movements, I suppose, they were so dignified and and so um, as if he just took this ritual incredibly seriously. Mm. And that there was- There's a sense of it being almost sacramental in its description. Absolutely, that's right. Uh, And that's what I I felt from from my witnessing of of the event. you know, he took he took his time. Um, he was not going to be rushed. Um, he was not embarrassed to be using a tap, um, or, or for people to be viewing him washing himself. Uh, so there was just a, a level of um, deep connection, I think, when I was witnessing this thing, and that that's what I felt, and that's what I took away, I think, from the experience, and and tried to get into the poem but as you said there are a lot of different levels of emotion in the poem well, well that's right and uh, and you know when you when you're talking you make these sort of quite um, strong statements you know don't tell me and you know, don't, this sort of thing which to me brings out a sort of a frustration or, or an anger like yeah so you're seeing this this beautiful event and this dignified person not worried about their station in life um, but being present in the moment mm. but there's also the sense that you're aware of all the sort of, um, I suppose, you know, you bring your own thoughts into it. 
and you're sort of rallying against those, questioning those thoughts almost. So I'm not sure I'm sort of poking around in the dark here. Um, no, I think that's, that's absolutely correct. And I, I think I'm also speaking to myself when I say things like, don't tell me. I'm, I'm saying to myself, look, um, yes, this man may be poor. Um, he may not have many resources, but here he is performing this act in a very sacramental, spiritual way that has power and gives him dignity and gives us all dignity, in fact. Mm, yeah, but you managed to move past the, the, the cliches. I know I've personally spent quite a bit of time in East Timor and I've had to you know, talk to people um, when I've been back and I've still got a long association where we run a program over there. And I, I know it's a point of frustration that, that it's so easy to talk about, oh, well, they, you know, this. They're so rich, they're poor, but they're rich in their happiness and all this sort of stuff. But I always feel uncomfortable talking about that. Um, yes. And this, I think that's why I gravitated towards this poem, because it's it's really just, it's so hard. Because, yes, that's true. Um, but poverty is a real thing. And, yes. Oh, yes. And it's brutal what yes. it does to people and our privilege. But and it's such an interesting tension to try and hold. And, and I think it rightfully makes you feel awkward makes you feel yes. angry it makes you feel this whole sort of gamut of sort of emotions and feelings yeah, absolutely i agree entirely um yes the whole experience of india as i said was very very confronting and uh, you know on, on every level it just it challenges your own you know preconceptions your own ideas about life um yeah so that that was i guess all the kind of mix of emotions that was going on in me when I was writing the poem um, and it was good to get a bit of distance I think I can't uh, really write in a situation that I'm in I have to move away from it and get a little bit of uh, distance and perspective before I can start you know processing what, what, what's been going on what I've witnessed yeah well it's interesting with the poem because th- there's certainly a sense of discovery when I'm reading it so I really connect to that idea of, of the sort of sacramental and um, Almost just the nature of, of this, this this person washing themselves. There's a word there. Um, it says it's the way he decants the water back and forth as if receiving instruction for the repetition of the names of God. And I think there's some really um, rich words in there. I think decant, for instance, right. you know, the idea of the water is actually a sort of a, a wine. Um, mm-hmm. sort of, I'm sure it, it takes it to this sort of this other level of, of um, uh, beauty. Um, but can you tell us a little bit about the that line the instructions for the repetition of the names of God? I found, I found that very evocative. Right. Um, well, I've always been interested in Indian religions, um, and uh, it was just the way that he was very, very careful with the water. I mean, maybe that's as a result of his poverty, and you know, you don't waste things. You you, you have this attitude towards things that. Um, you know, everything is kind of meaningful and, and wastage is a, a bad thing. Um, but, I mean, he could have left the tap on a bit, but um, he he just was so mindful of, I guess, the, the value of the water as well, as if it was a sacred thing that he was bringing to himself. He was giving himself a kind of gift. Um, and... I guess I just made that connection in my mind between the spirituality of India and the actions of the man. It seemed to just, you know, sort of come together in an organic way. When I, I mean, I didn't know I was going to say that in the poem until I worked through the poem and, and considered the experience, and, and that's what emerged. Yeah, well, there's, there's also um, your own cultural reference, I suppose, to, to, that, to the depth of, of what's going on there when you say I have seen people look less reverent tuning Mozart so taking this moment out of your own cultural milieu and bringing it back and sort of comparing it um, and th- that's a really great perspective I think to, to, to put on the poem as well um, it was also I think the repetition of his actions too like you take a handful of water uh, and then another handful, and so the repetition just kind of um, resonated with you know things like chanting, repeating names of God, and things like that, which they do a great deal in India. So it all just sort of came together in a way. 
So another question I've got for you is the poem is, well, um, when you read it on the page, um, which listeners won't appreciate so much because they can't see the poem, but there's a, the, the lines are you know, typically pretty much all in jammed. And jammed means they run through one line to the, to the next. Um, so it sort of cascades down the page. The idea I, I had there, there was the fluidity of his movements, the fluidity of water is kind of represented in those lines that sort of pour down the page. Is that something that you were aware of or is that something I'm just reading into? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I think that's a, a lovely observation, James. And um, uh, I, I work very hard at my line endings. Um, I think that's one of the challenges of writing a free verse poem is that there's no hard and fast rule about where to put the line break. Um, and I do like to push the reader through the poem, so rather than have each line, you know, end stopped, um, make those lines flow on, especially for a poem like that, because as you said, there's a lot of water imagery and so forth, and um, I right. had to find the right, you know, lineation that would um, enhance that, embody that. Yeah, well, I definitely got that impression, but there are a couple of end stops, so you end mm. on Mozart. So there's yes. a moment where, and to me they seem like the, the moments of quite profound ref, reflection on your mm-hmm. behalf. Mm-hmm. Have these moments, and then there's a cascade, and then there's a moment. Yeah. So, so in German, is it? You, you talk about that's something you work pretty hard at. I do. I work very hard at lineation, and I tried very a, a lot of different versions before I settle on the final one. Obviously. Yeah. Um, there's a great book on. Um, uh, the Art of the Poetic Line by an American chap called James Longenbach, and he goes into the the line, the uh, free verse line, in a great deal of detail. And um, I've read that book several times because I felt it was very, very instructive about the effect of you know end stopping or running on. Mm. Um, I think you know that the use of the line breaks can make or break a poem. You know, um, they're oh, they very, can. very important. Yeah, you and, think of a poem like Ozymandias. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, which is a sonnet form, so it's not free verse, but it has a, a, these mag- majestic uh, run-on and jammed lines that sort of speak of the the flowing desert mm. winds and that sort of thing. And without that, those lines, the, the poem is diminished. I think. Yes, th- that's right. Um, and it's, I think, a really good point to talk about because there are budding poets who may be just um, you know starting on their sort of uh, potential careers as poets. It's to really think about lines and, and mm. enjambment and mm. that there's this other dimension to, to and I think the development of, of uh, a knowledge of that comes later I think in, in a development of a, po- uh, a poet's um, career perhaps yes oh definitely I think um, and I think probably the line is the hardest thing to get right in a free verse poem um, so uh, uh, just a good thing to do with your own work is just to constantly experiment with different line endings. Mm. Um, and I've, uh, for my students, I, I would take you know a famous poem and I would relineate it in a totally different form, and compare you know how uh, just you know changing some of the line breaks mm. really ruins the poem yeah, or just takes away its power, yeah. just changes it completely. It does. Yeah, I've yeah. done that with um, the Red Wheelbarrow by, by oh, William right, Carlos yes. Williams mm. with, with our students before, and it's fascinating. This is just a three line poem, um, but the the, the end, you know, how it is broken up is critical yes. to, to, to what it's saying. I think that's right. Yeah. And I think it, it's often difficult for, for new writers to to understand that. It takes time to appreciate, I think, uh, you know, the, the power of where, where to actually put your line break is yeah, crucial. Think, well, we're, we're born into a world where I think as young people um, we get used to the end stop. That's that's the yeah. convention that we, we is lodged in our minds. Th- and and it's right. actually an interesting thing for, um, I suppose, for, for rap artists and stuff, that would be... And you actually hear that in a lot of rap. The, mm-hmm. um, I think in jam it flow on um, effects. Um, the really good rappers, they play with that that sort mm. of technique, um, whereas the conventional ones will, you know, be more like you know, heavy rhymes and end yes. stopped rhythms and that sort of um, yep. technique. Yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. So, what are you working on at the moment? Um. I'm trying to get uh, a next collection together. Um, it'll be an assortment of things, I think. Um, part of the book is written in the voice of um, a chap who lived um, 500 BC and who was the father of uh, Siddhartha Gautama, who became the Buddha. His name is Suddhodana. 
Um, so I've written some poems from the point of view of um, Sudatta, his cousin David Datta, and now I'm doing this sequence from the father's point of view. Uh, so the father was the king of a uh, Indian state called Sakya. Um, and of course he wanted his son to follow in his footsteps, but he, he chose another path. So all those sort of family tensions, if you like, the, the politics, the, you know, it's, it's a fascinating story. It's fascinated me since I was a, a little kid, actually. And I can't let go of it. <laughs> yeah, so it sounds like you've got quite an enduring um, association with India in particular. Yes, in I haven't. I, I, look, it's, it has fascinated me. I haven't been back there for some time, but... Um, yeah, I feel, you know, it's part of me somehow, India. Um, it's religions, it's, um, it's landscape, uh, it's history, it's, it's religious figures have always meant a great deal to me. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. So um, you're in retirement now. Um, so what is the... I assume you're never going to be uh, stopping writing your poetry. Um, are you active on the poetry scene at all? Do, do mentor any any writers or uh, look I, I do do that I, I also run an online course for some of my former students at Sydney and um, I occasionally do things for the writers centre or in the community so I'm constantly kind of doing a little bit of this and that um, it's really good because you know it's uh, I, I love the poetry community everyone's very supportive I, I'm not a great um, I suppose socializer I'm quite a shy retiring sort of person so I don't, you know, get out there terribly much, but I, most of my friends are poets and, um, you know, I've always had lots of connections with, with the poetry world. Well, um, Judith, it's been wonderful talking to you on the podcast. As I said, I'm really, it was really pleasing to um, be working on this particular poem. And it was actually, it was, it was difficult to try to bring together. So if, uh, if people get the opportunity to go and watch the video um, for this it's hold. a lovely video, James. I really, really appreciate yeah, what you've done with it. It was tricky because I was trying to wrestle and hold that idea of um, not being cliche with the images or not being irreverent with the images. Mm. And, and it was really, really difficult to find appropriate yeah. material. Um, it took quite some time to do it. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm really look, happy. Look, thank you very much. Thank you for having me on this wonderful program. It's been oh, a no, that's great all right. pleasure. Well, anyway, the poem, the video reflects the, how wonderful the poem is, I think. Uh, yeah, so look, once again, thank you, Judith, and um, I'm sure I'm, I'm, maybe I'll be featuring another one of your poems in upcoming seasons. Thank you, that'll be times. great. Yeah, Thanks, okay. James. Thank you. Thank you. So it's time to wrap up this week's episode and say goodbye. To stay notified of upcoming episodes, don't forget to subscribe to our podcast. And of course, a beautiful video clip of today's poem is also available for viewing on our YouTube channel. For other poetry resources, visit our website at www.litpoetry.com. Lit Poetry has got some excellent content planned for the weeks ahead, with work from Seamus Heaney, Liesl Mueller and John Kinsella to be featured in upcoming episodes. We hope you enjoyed this week's poem. Thanks for dropping in, and I'll see you next time. Man Washing on a Railway Platform Outside Delhi by Judith Beveridge It's the way he stands, nearly naked in the winter sun, turning on and off the railway station tap. I've seen people look less reverent tuning Mozart. I've seen hands give coins to beggars appear nonchalant compared to the way his hands give this water to his body. Don't tell me this is a man released for a moment out of poverty, a man who wants the penance of each cold drop. A man who wants the smell of his neighbors to vanish from his skin. Who wants to taste what is beyond the scum and effluent of the village ditch. And don't tell me each drop he takes to glisten his body will never be neutral 
though he holds each clear spill with equality. It isn't just the water. It's the way his hands take the water from the tap to his body. It's the way he attends each pour. It's the way he decants the water back and forth as if receiving instruction for the repetition of the names of God. And it's the way he knows his poverty without privacy and the way, though the water is free, he takes careful leaders. You've been listening to the Lit Poetry Podcast, presented by James Laidler. For more podcasts, poetry videos, and other useful resources, visit our website at www.litpoetry.com. Thanks for listening.